European People's Party Group in the European Committee of the Regions. It is a pleasure for me to moderate today's event on such an important topic uh, of resilient cities and regions, the role of dis digitalization with two panels, the first one being devoted to cities and regions in the digital age, and the second one exploring the topic of tackling the digital divide for Europe's recovery. We have an exciting lineup of speakers, uh, but first of all, let me mention our main guest for today, Maria Gabrielle, European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth. And of course, I've heard her speak at the EPP Women's Congress many times, where I can assure you she is heard in very high esteem. Madam Commissioner, I warmly welcome you to our event and I thank you for accepting our invitation this morning. Dear participants, I'm also looking forward to hearing your questions and inputs from your end. And we hope to have a lovely and a lively and dynamic debate with our guest speakers. Finally, we are proud to have with us our most distinguished EPP representatives from all the different levels of government, European, national, regional, and local. Before starting our debate, please allow me to share with you some housekeeping rules. Interpretation is available this morning in English, French, Polish, and German. We will be communicating on social media and we invite you to join us to spread the word online via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. For Twitter at EPP underscore core, for Facebook forward slash EPP group core, and for Instagram at EPP underscore core. Don't forget also to tag at EPP underscore core or use the hashtags uh, EPP local dialogue, digitalization, and EPP Euro, uh, EU Regions Week. I remind you that the event will be recorded and streamed on social media. I welcome each one of you again, and I kindly ask that all speakers should stick to the allocated time slot so as to give the opportunity to ensure a smooth running of our event. To avoid background noise during the meeting, your microphone will be muted by default. Three important features that you can access with buttons at the bottom of your screen. Participants window to view all other attendees. The interpretation window to allow you to choose the language of your choice. And the chat window, of course, to ask questions to panelists and share comments with other attendees. To ask a panelist a question, please virtually raise your hand and wait for me to give you the floor. When given the floor, turn on your mic and your camera by pressing unmute and start video. Turn off your mic when not speaking, please. Alternatively, you can type your questions in the chat window and write the name of the panelists you wish to hear from. Let us, know, let us now start the event by watching together a video we prepared for you. This video is intended to better frame today's topics. Let's watch it together. The pandemic has shown us the importance of the digital transition. From health services to education and sales, all sectors have been transformed over the past months. While EU policies seek to enable the digital transition, Various challenges still exist across villages, cities and regions. Access to affordable and high-quality broadband networks and services, particularly in remote and rural areas, is still work in progress. At the same time, the almost 24.5 million European small and medium-sized enterprises, employing two out of every three workers in the EU, are still lagging behind in terms of digital transition. Cities and regions are committed to do their part to support the switch to modern, functional, digital and green infrastructure in their communities. 
regional and local leaders are at work to facilitate partnerships between the public, private, educational and non-profit sectors to implement programs focusing on advanced digital skills and cutting-edge technologies such as artificial intelligence, cyber security and high-performance computing. European policies and programs need to reflect challenges on the ground by engaging local and regional authorities. The level of governance closest to the people and the level responsible for implementing 70% of EU legislation to address such challenges, facilitate the digital transition and open new horizons. Today's EPP Local Dialogue is an opportunity to discuss the status of the digital transition and the role digitalization can play to ensure economic recovery through resilient cities and regions. Well, there you have it. We now start with the first panel devoted to cities and regions in the digital age, delivering on education and innovation to shape the future of European communities. Dear guests, let me introduce our first speaker. A warm welcome to our president, Olgerd Gebelevich, president of the EPP Group in the European Committee of the Regions and president of West Pomeranian Region and host of this EPP Local Dialogue. Dear Olgerd, we just heard in the video that the pandemic has shown the urgency for all layers of governance, including regional and local administrations, to accelerate their digitalization process to respond to the greater citizens' needs and rapidly adapt to this new context. Your region, the region of West Pomerania, is considered as a leader in innovation for areas such as renewable energy and transports. Can you explain how digitalization impacts on such policies? And how do you see a future where digitalization will play an even greater role in driving the choices of political leaders? And how your region makes use of the financial resources made available in the MFF to become even more resilient. Algird, you have the floor for five minutes. Do we have Algird? Um, it appears that there is a slight glitch. Obviously, this is very important this morning that we hear from all the leaders. I think now we have it's Oliver. Almost there. Yes, thank you. We are connecting. Okay, thanks once again, dear Deidre, dear Commission Gabriel, dear guests and speakers. It is my great pleasure uh, to give you a warm personal welcome. Also, on behalf of all members of the European People's Party in the Committee of Regions. Uh, debating on issue of digitalization is never enough, uh, especially in the times we're, we're living through. Uh, this is reason why I strongly wanted to organize a local dialogue on such a topic. In fact, digitalization is a matter that concerns all of us. Making digitalization work for everyone means making citizens' life easier, supporting small and medium businesses by simplifying rules and reducing administrative burdens, allowing access to the benefits of the solid digital uh, single market based on free and fair competition, and last but not least, empowering citizens' ownership in, uh, uh, of the democratic rights in the freedoms. The digital transformation of society before well, uh, uh, began well before uh, the occurrence of the pandemic. It is at least uh, a three decades long story. Still one of the side effects of pandemic is a much amplified awareness among people, among business sector, among public administration uh, on the fast growing 
importance for digital connectivity, technologies, and services. In one word on the digital transition, in its recently published report, the state of digital transformation at regional level, the COR has identified a huge number of factors influencing the digital transition at subnational level. Some of them are extremely stimulating. Let me briefly share them with you. First of all, we can see a widespread divide between rural and urban areas in terms of coverage of digital infrastructures. This can slow down competitive advantage uh, that may be generated by digital transformation. There are also differences across European regions in terms of users' digital skills. In certain, uh, I, I'm certain that Commissioner Gabriel will take this issue in a few minutes, so I don't want to go much into details. Secondly, the digitalization of interaction between public authorities and business is still inefficient. Uh, this is not happening in all member states, but it still represents a serious threat on the path toward achieving a fair and cohesive digital single market. This is a crucial point for regional and local leaders. Public authorities have the duty to create synergies, to unlock the potential of a swift transformation process of the public and private sectors. As the leader myself of regional government, I can ensure you that an efficient public administration with sufficient managerial vision to invest on digital service can propel a mighty how effect on whole society. Third and last point, strategies for competitiveness, innovation and growth should be coupled with this for digital transition. Original authorities should identify providers and beneficiaries for digital services in order to create a truly integrated digital innovation ecosystem. Such an ecosystem must become a, a living lab where all actors from business actors to education and to research institutions and public administration can work hand in hand. Our colleague Marco Marcula will certainly mention uh, all this in second panel of local dialogue. Dear Deirre, answering to your question on the projects undergoing in my region of West Pomerania region in Poland, yes, of course, we have amazing projects of all uh, of this aim to creating a better living standards uh, for our people and uh, often coupled with the two big transitions of our times, digital and the green one. I am absolutely convinced and more, that the more connected and digital society will also help us deliver on the EU Green Deal goals. Uh, but our projects go beyond that and finally involve many sectors, including, for instance, health and public services. Actually, I'm very proud to say that uh, we are one of the pioneers in Poland and the national levels uh, as regard to investments on the digital transition in, for example, uh, health sector. And uh, I would like to may, make a couple of remarks on that. The West Pomeranian eHealth, it is an ongoing project, project in my region, uh, worth something like 10 million of euro, co-financed by, by EU. And the subject of the project is create a regional e-health platform providing services to, for patients, uh, which can ultimately be used in all medical entities uh, local located in my region. And it doesn't matter if it is public or private, 
uh, hospital or facility, uh, regardless on their legal or ownership status, will be, all will be able to use the project results, in particular as services and the collection and sharing of electronic medical data at regional level. So we uh, we hope that it will be right now after in I think that in next year without any problems we will can smoothly exchange data between all our uh, medical uh, medical facilities in our region uh, to improve the quality of uh, of healthcare system in my region and I have to add that it is not first the pro project we implemented on, on such a topic the first one cross border healthcare uh, realized by my region and region of brandenburg foppermann uh, we exactly did the same between some of our hospitals we create some kind of network of cooperation with the german hospitals uh, to allow the quick exchange of data what for to consult to consult medical services uh, uh, because as you surely know on the both side we still have some kind of shortages in to, in our medical staff and second project i would like to mention it is construction of a regional infrastructure of spatial information for west pomeranian region it is worth something about 13 million of euro of course uh, co-financed by you as well and this uh, project is uh, 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 to creation of the IC, uh, ICT system with the aims to develop and modernize intra-administrative e-service to be provided to our citizens as well to the public administration units. Special planning is still a huge challenge uh, in construction and uh, performance of regional and local development you surely know, and innovative and digital approach to spatial planning, I'm sure that will allow us to improve our possibilities uh, in governing our region in growing together. And on the other hand, it improves to, uh, to better access uh, to data for all our citizens as well. So we have uh, two I, I would say quite interesting, very innovative uh, the projects realized in my region. If you are uh, more specific, specifically interested in those projects and wish to know more, I will delight to provide all details and information from my team in Brussels and in Poland. Uh, so dear guests, uh, I conclude in here because uh, it's now time to listen to Commissioner Gabriel, please do not hesitate here, raise your hands uh, in the question and as answers session uh, later, uh, when you have question or any comments of any items I mentioned in my intervention. Thank you once again. I'm very delighted that we organize this local dialogue. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, mm -hmm. Algir. That's certainly very innovative. Um, and you're showing the way uh, to all of us. Uh, let us now move to our next speaker. And it is a very great pleasure for me to introduce to you Maria Gabriel, European Commissioner for Innovative Research, Culture, Education and Youth. It is for us a true privilege to address Ms. Gabriel. Not only is she a passionate advocate of European policies, a long-standing friend of the core, and she's all, first of all a woman whose reputation and intellectual capital is outstanding, and above all committed to serve our communities with pragmatism and responsiveness. We cannot, uh, dear Commissioner Gabrielle, uh, the floor is yours now. Merci, merci beaucoup. Je vais m'exprimer en français puisque la possibilité m'est donnée. Tout d'abord, Monsieur le Président du groupe PPE au Comité des Régions, chers membres, c'est un véritable plaisir pour moi de participer dans cet échange. Je voudrais féliciter le groupe PPE pour l'organisation d'un débat sur un sujet aussi crucial. 
Aujourd'hui, je voudrais commencer en rappelant que 75 des Européens vivent dans les villes et le chiffre devrait passer à plus de 83 en 2050. Il est donc primordial que nos stratégies en faveur des villes et des régions prennent en compte cette dynamique. C'est pour cela, quand on adresse la question de l'éducation et de l'innovation, je voudrais d'abord prendre une minute pour dire que la première chose, c'est que nous devons tirer les leçons de la pandémie. Pendant un an et demi, quand on parle éducation et innovation dans nos régions, nous avons vu quelles sont nos forces et quelles sont nos faiblesses. Les faiblesses, nous les connaissons. Il nous faut des équipements, il nous faut de la connectivité, il nous faut de l'accès à des services. Nos forces, c'est justement le rôle des régions parce que sur place, ce sont les principaux moteurs à ce que l'éducation et l'innovation soient accessibles à tous et ce qu'on puisse construire de véritables écosystèmes. La plus grande leçon pour moi de cette pandémie, c'est que nous avons tous vu à quel point le rôle de l'éducation, de l'innovation et de la recherche sont cruciaux. Mais ce rôle n'est pas une fin en soi. Ce qu'il nous faudra en premier, et là je voudrais remercier le groupe PPE au comité des régions, parce que cela fait des années qu'on clame d'avoir de véritables synergies. Le deuxième point, c'est que si on veut réussir l'éducation et l'innovation accessibles à tous, pour chacune de nos régions, il est vrai qu'il est grand temps de transformer les mots « synergie » entre en quelque chose d'opérationnel sur le terrain, en quelque chose de pragmatique et quelque chose qui apporte de bénéfices à nos citoyens. Et quand je parle de synergie, je les examine sur deux plans. D'abord, des synergies internes. Il nous faudra bâtir des synergies entre les différents programmes de l'Union européenne. En ce qui me concerne, c'est une priorité d'avoir de véritables synergies entre le programme Horizon Europe, le programme Erasmus+, et les fonds de cohésion, et le fonds de développement régional. Et ici, encore une fois, le défi, c'est de nouveau les régions qui peuvent donner des réponses. C'est vous qui savez au mieux comment ces synergies peuvent se traduire en des actions concrètes sur le terrain. Ce que je voudrais euh, qu'on fasse au niveau européen, c'est qu'on facilite le travail des régions. La deuxième chose, justement, les synergies ne sont pas seulement internes entre les différents programmes, mais les synergies sont aussi avec les régions et les villes. Je vois les régions comme de véritables innovation hubs. Ce sont de véritables ter terroirs de l'expérimentation de projets qui sont inspirants, qui apportent des bénéfices et qui permettent à l'Europe de se positionner dans cette nouvelle décennie numérique. Et cela passe par un processus de co-création. Le président vient de parler des questions de gouvernance. C'est quelque chose qui, à la Commission, nous tient à cœur également. Quand je dis co-création, cela veut dire ensemble avec les régions et ensemble avec les citoyens, depuis le départ, de définir les solutions qui sont nécessaires à la région, mais ensuite surtout de la mettre en œuvre ensemble avec les citoyens et ensemble avec les régions. Et j'ai trois exemples. Le premier exemple, c'est notre plan d'action commun avec le comité des régions. Nous devons bâtir maintenant sur ce plan d'action prévu pour les deux prochaines années pour mettre en avant des initiatives concrètes. Je donne des initiatives comme avoir des réseaux entre les maires des différentes villes qui travaillent ensemble. Il y a cinq mois, nous avons fait rencontrer pour la première fois les maires des capitales européennes de la culture avec les capitales européennes de l'innovation. Il est vrai qu'aujourd'hui, nous avons besoin à ce que les maires des différentes villes puissent travailler ensemble, voir des solutions communes et on s'en sert de leurs bonnes pratiques. Les deux autres exemples sont les missions, c'est une grande nouveauté du programme Horizon Europe, et le Bauhaus. Pour les missions, j'aimerais attirer l'attention du groupe sur la mission « Ville intelligente et neutre pour le climat ». C'est une mission qui propose d'ici 2030 d'avoir 100 villes européennes climatiquement neutres, intelligentes, et de permettre justement à ces 100 villes d'agir comme des centres d'expérimentation qui inspirent et aident toutes les autres villes européennes à être climatiquement neutres d'ici 2050. J'aimerais ici vous encourager à participer dans l'appel à manifestation d'intérêt qui sera publié prochainement avant la fin de l'année et qui va justement 
s'engager ensemble avec les villes dans la poursuite de cet objectif où l'innovation, les compétences, l'éducation vont de pair avec une co-création avec les citoyens, vont de pair avec une prise en considération des spécificités locales et de la spécificité régionale. Ce qu'on voudrait, c'est véritablement, ensemble avec les villes, de développer des solutions. Le deuxième exemple, c'est le Bauhaus européen. Je pense qu'ici, les régions et les villes ont un rôle crucial à, à jouer il y a deux semaines, nous avons lancé les premières propositions à appel à des projets. Nous avons 25 millions d'euros qui sont dédiés à ce que justement nos villes nous disent. Pour qu'on réussisse le pacte vert, il faut que le domaine de l'éducation, de la culture, de l'innovation, de la recherche travaillent ensemble pour qu'on puisse à ce moment permettre de réduire les différences là où cela existe, inspirer d'autres et affirmer un véritable leadership européen. Et ici, je voudrais euh, insister sur le fait que nous avons l'accès à une action de 2 millions d'euros qui vise à développer des modèles innovants et collaboratifs de gouvernance locale afin de nouer le dialogue avec les citoyens, avec les parties prenantes. Et ces travaux vont nous permettre d'identifier les projets emblématiques qui vont euh, englober les trois valeurs fondamentales du Bauhaus. Un point sur l'innovation, c'est mon troisième point après les leçons de la pandémie et les synergies. Le point sur l'innovation. Aujourd'hui, plus que jamais, nous comptons sur les régions pour élaborer un véritable écosystème de l'innovation. Aujourd'hui, nous avons besoin de nos talents et nous avons besoin d'avoir des politiques qui sont adaptées aux besoins locaux. Et c'est en cela que des instruments sont à disposition des régions. Je parle du Conseil européen de l'innovation ou encore de l'Institut européen de l'innovation et de la technologie. J'insiste sur l'Institut européen de l'innovation et de la technologie. Sa spécificité, c'est que depuis le débat, départ, on construit un écosystème où l'innovation est ensemble avec l'éducation, avec le numérique, avec la recherche. Et c'est pour cela que je lance peut-être un défi. Pourquoi pas ne pas faire un réseau entre les différents colocation centers où le groupe PPE est très actif et de pouvoir identifier ensemble comment on peut s'attaquer à la nécessité d'avoir des gens avec les compétences numériques nécessaires, d'avoir une innovation qui promeut les petites et moyennes entreprises, les start-up, et qui permet à la région de bâtir des capacités afin d'affirmer en leadership. Le quatrième point, c'est sur l'éducation. Vous savez que nous avons maintenant la décennie numérique. Elle a des ambitions. Je rappelle, 20 millions de spécialistes en ICT d'ici 2030. 80% des citoyens européens doivent avoir des compétences numériques de base. Or, aujourd'hui, nous sommes à 56% et c'est encore 44% de nos citoyens. C'est pour cela, je pense qu'il faudra à ce moment avoir une véritable approche holistique. Nous avons des instruments pour renforcer les compétences numériques de base. C'est le plan d'action sur l'éducation numérique, c'est l'espace européen de l'éducation. Je vais donner deux exemples très concrets où nous avons besoin des régions pour les promouvoir. Concernant les compétences numériques, nous avons un Digital Opportunity Trainingship. Nous avons décidé la possibilité de donner ces, ces compétences à 60 000 étudiants et 20 000 apprenants dans le Vocational Education d'ici 2027. Un accent ici particulier est mis aussi sur les filles. Nous avons besoin de plus de filles et plus de femmes dans le domaine numérique. Et ici, avec l'Institut européen de l'innovation et de la technologie, nous voulons offrir des formations à 40 000 filles. Évidemment que c'est une base, évidemment que ce n'est pas encore la masse critique, mais je suis sûre que si les régions ici joignent des forces, si on s'unit, on peut avoir un impact beaucoup plus grand. Quand on parle de l'éducation, je voudrais souligner en une phrase le rôle des enseignants. Plus que jamais, nos enseignants ont besoin d'avoir accès à des formations. Je rappelle que plus de 50 des enseignants européens ont dit pendant la pandémie que c'était leur première expérience. C'est pour cela qu'avec le programme Erasmus+, nous allons créer 25 académies européennes des enseignants afin de donner la possibilité des enseignants de toutes les régions, les régions éloignées, les régions rurales, les régions dans les centres urbains, 
de pouvoir offrir à leurs enseignants les meilleures formations. Parce que nous le savons, jamais les nouvelles technologies vont remplacer les enseignants, mais les nouvelles technologies dans les bonnes mains d'un enseignant qui sait quoi faire peut énormément soutenir nos enfants, nos talents et la prochaine génération. Ici, j'attire l'attention sur un dernier élément. C'est aux régions de nous aider de transformer l'idée du réseau européen de Education Hubs en quelque chose d'opérationnel. Je le dis avec une petite pensée. Nous avons tellement de hubs, Digital Innovation Hub, Science Hub, Excellence Hub. Maintenant, on va avoir des Education Hubs. Je pense que oui, c'est aussi sur les régions qu'on doit se reposer davantage pour remplir de contenu adéquat ces hubs. On doit faire quoi dans ce hub On doit avoir un point d'accès, pas d'une simple information et des brochures, ça doit être un droit où la formation pourrait être offerte aux entreprises, aux enseignants, aux services publics. Et ça, c'est quelque chose qui me tient à cœur. La deuxième, la renforcer le lien entre l'université et l'industrie envisager à chaque fois la recherche, l'innovation et l'éducation comme un, un, un entier, et pour cela, les villes savent faire. Je vais m'arrêter ici. Je pense que mon message est très clair. Nous avons un momentum à saisir. Ce momentum passe par les synergies avec le Next Generation EU and Resilience and Recovery Facility Plan. Nos analyses montrent qu'en termes d'éducation, pour la première fois, les États membres vont investir 55 milliards d'euros dans l'éducation numérique, vont investir 35 milliards d'euros dans la recherche et l'innovation. Si aujourd'hui, on a une chance d'utiliser cet investissement aussi pour faire avancer, pour faire changer et pour capitaliser sur les bonnes pratiques, c'est grâce aux régions qu'on a plus de chances de le faire. Et c'est mon message je compte sur vous, vous avez notre soutien. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Commissioner, for those very wise words and for setting out your vision and the vision of the European Commission, especially in the fields of innovation and startups and education, of course. And it's wonderful to hear about the 25 European academies uh, to assist teachers in their work. We look forward to following on from that vision. And also, thank you for your praise of the European regions and cities. It's much appreciated. Now it's time to move to our third speaker for this panel. Let me give a warm welcome to Mr. Peter Gersak, State Secretary, but also an IT solutions expert in the Slovenian Ministry for Digital Transformation. Mr. Gersak. I know that Slovenia's Digital Transformation Office was only recently established by the government. Allow me to say that congratulations, that is a clear statement of the importance uh, that your country and your Prime Minister Jasna in particular attaches to the digital transition. Slovenia is currently holding the presidency of the European Council and digital transformation is one of its key priorities. Can you explain to us what is the mission of your newly established ministry and what are the ideas of the Slovenian presidency in terms of progress needed on digital services and markets to set new standards in the use of digital platforms? Dear State Secretary, the floor is yours for four minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me well? I can yeah. hear you perfectly. Okay. Perfect. So, dear President uh, Geblevich, dear Commissioner Gabriel, dear participants uh, of the virtual uh, local uh, dialogue, um, as a proud Slovenians and Europeans, we strongly believe that Slovenia, as a proud member of the EU, has many strengths, including its robust single market openness to international trade, highly skilled workforce and world-class innovation centers. Uh, I won't touch so much on the on the Europe itself, but I would like to refer now to your actually to your question. Um, yes, recently in Slovenia has been established. Uh, it is not ministry yet; it is government office for digital transformation. Uh, but still, it sits uh, and it can, uh, it will, it is uh, co coordinating the all the digital transformation which is happening 
among the ministries, among the public institutions, and among the among the whole society and and uh, in, in Slovenia. Uh, so that's that's basically our goal. Since uh, Slovenia wants to be a next uh, tech star of Europe, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, uh, pr our president, uh, prime minister, has um, established uh, six months ago uh, the, uh, the the National Digitalization Council, uh, which is actually advising body to to uh, to the government. And this council is composed uh, of leading entrepreneurs, researchers, and educators. And it took us less than two months to actually draft. Uh, uh, 40 measures as a first package of uh, of digital transformation measures, um, which will accelerate it, uh, uh, accelerate the digital transformation of government ser services, healthcare, education, and society at, at, at a large scale. Yeah. Um, just for example, two of these uh, measures are are. Uh, digital voucher for uh, life learning for example for promotion of life life uh, long learning of digital skills so beneficiaries will be prim primary and high school uh, students uh, and retirees um, and this will be able to redeem the digital voucher uh, with different providers of uh, trainings and and classes yeah uh, of course in a, in a Training in in a, in a, for in, in in terms of IT usage of, of digital tools, um, and particular particular emphasis will be also placed uh, on the use of the online services provided by the public admin. We know that in Slovenia we have uh, fairly developed public uh, services, uh, electronic public services uh, tools. Uh, but uh, the usage is not uh, enough. It's only a few percentage. Yeah. Uh, and the second one is like um, virtual administrative point. Uh, we are aware that um, not all the citizens will be able to go to digital. Uh, so we will enable citizens uh, to use administrative and other public administration services via secure audio video links. Um, also, they will be able to uh, arrange appoint appointments, uh, authentication, document exchange, uh, digital signing, and, and payments as well. So that's, and we have like 40 of this. The next package of 40, 30, 40, it's coming in, in the next, next month. And these are what we think that uh, to our prime role, which is actually coordinating the, the ecosystem of digital transformation in Slovenia, uh, these are then the accelerators which will plug in to the framework and it will greatly accelerate it, the digital transformation development. So now um, regarding, as, as you mentioned, uh, Slovenia is holding currently presidency of the Council of the EU. Uh, and we are working on many on, of uh, digital acts like AI Act, um, Data Governance Act, uh, Digital Markets Act, uh, Services Act. So both uh, mentioned uh, last two, so Digital Services and Digital Market Acts. Um, and uh, of course, some of the others are uh, priorities of the Slovenian presidency. And of course, uh, uh, AI Act, of course. So uh, um, we find very important to prevent the exposure of citizens uh, to increasing risks and uh, harmful, cons harmful consequences online and to coordinate it and make more efficient the control over the uh, large platforms and to rebalance the rights and responsibilities of the users, intermediary platforms and uh, public authorities. Um, so therefore, um, the EU will introduce a series of new and harmonized obligations for digital services, as you probably know, such as rules for the removal of illegal goods, services, or, or, or content online, uh, new obligations for very la large platforms to prevent abuse of their systems, transparency measure measures, including uh, online advertising, new rules to help track down sellers of illegal goods or services, and enhance cooperation among public authorities 
to ensure, to ensure effective enforcement across the single market. Um, as well, Artificial Intelligence Act uh, for Slovenia is particularly important. Um, so we would like the Slovenian presidency to, to uh, create a high level of trust uh, to the technology. Um, and we should develop and uh, use AI in a way that it is responsible AI focused on common interest and on, on, on people, yeah. Um, so we will emphasize ethical uh, technology, safety, and fundamental rights and values of EU citizens, which is, I think it's very, very important also when we are talking about AI, for example, yeah. Um, so what we need to do here is to maximize investment in, into the research uh, in, 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 in EU as a, as, a, as, a, as a whole, I think, not only in Slovenia. Um, we know that many, that uh, brain drain is happening also from uh, European Union to, to other countries outside of the of EU. So we need to retain uh, our researchers in, in AI. Um, so we need to create more synergies and networks between several European AI research centers and coordinate their, their, their efforts. Um, so uh, it is also essential that uh, public sector and public administration are rapidly uh, being to introduce uh, the AI based, AI based products and services into I'm their sorry own- Sorry to intervene, uh, Mr. Gersik, but could you wind up because we have- Yes, I just, I, I'm just having one more sentence. Perfect. So both acts I was uh, talking about, um, we would like to bring, uh, to, when our presidency is reaching to the end, to the to the general approach as 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 much as, as possible. So thank you and back to you. Thank you very much. Wonderful about the digital vouchers and of course your policy on the risks of online and how you're counteracting that. Um, I'll go straight to two questions, please. One from Mr. Emil Bach, as the commissioner has to leave very rapidly. I'd ask uh, the speaker to keep their question very brief. Thank you. Do we have Mr. Emil Bach? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, dear Commissioner. It's always a great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, and thank you for being so close to our local and regional authorities all the time and being present in every corner of Europe to support us in a large variety of activities like uh, education, culture, but not last uh, innovations and ecosystems. As I said, you are a true inspiration to all of us. Dear Commissioner, uh, you said once that um, uh, innovation cannot be dictated from Brussels, but uh, of course can be supported from uh, a European funds perspective. I'd like to tell you that in um, our city of Cluj-Napoca, we, we launched last week the very first um, innovation fund for uh, uh, young people between 16 and 26 and is the very first in the country taking your model to do at the local level and having the, the European support. Last but not least, dear commissioner, I know how strong you are a supporter um, against digital divide and innovation uh, divide in Europe. So from that perspective, we, you have all our, all our support. I have one uh, final question. Uh, how about the European education area portal uh, alongside the digital education hub are they, are they going to be timely uh, in place before the end of the year? And I'll close my short intervention with a uh, congratulation to the Secretary of State uh, from, from Slovenia, Mr. Peter Jersak, because uh, your model of uh, National Digital Transformation Office is really a model which could, can be replicated in many parts of Europe at the local or regional level. Myself in, in Cluj-Napoca, Romania, I already established a transformation digital office having your model from the national level. So thank you for being a true inspiration again, uh, very pragmatic and concrete. Thank you to both of you. Thank you, Emil. Now, could we have Marku, Markula, please? Um, thank you, thank you very much. I do not hear Mr. Markula. Um, uh, Maria Gabriela, you have stressed heavily 
the role of cities and the committee of the regions in implementing, as you said today, the missions, especially the smart cities, carbon neutral cities, and uh, with the help of uh, new Bauhaus, with the help of educational hubs, uh, era hubs, and so on. So we here at the committee of the region, especially with our EPP led cities and regions, we are doing really much for the very systematic uh, process approach, how to make this a reality at the local level, because the mission starts from the latest scientific knowledge and it needs to integrate all the way to the innovations and the real life practice. So is this something that you feel strongly that can be the missions, can they be something more from the bottom up? Not only that we wait for a year or two years, but we mobilize and you stress, do you stress heavily that we need to mobilize now the cities and regions to work. Uh, just an example, we could take uh, Helsinki region, Espo to work with Sofia, Kabravo, Cluj, Napoca, have a pioneering cities on this systematic operational model, how to make the transition, the renewal to happen for the citizens, their benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Markula. Now, um, maybe Commissioner Marielle would like to wrap up and answer those questions, as I know you have to leave urgently. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I must say that the Milbock and uh, Mr. Markula are an inspiration for me, and I, 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 I'm very grateful to all your efforts because you can, we can see that we are, if we are advancing on the ground, that's exactly because you know the needs and it always, you are always asking for concrete and adequate answers. So, Mayor Bog, just my, my, my great appreciation for what you have done. I very much welcome this idea of the Innovation Fund, and I must say that we'll be very glad if we exchange a little bit more because you know that actually we are in a in a co-creation process to have a european innovation ecosystem and of course if there is any chances to scale some of the good practices and you have a lot that will be a great pleasure for me with my team to support you yes i might say that that's our intention for the digital education hubs to have to have them at the end of, by the end of the year because the question again it's not to have an another uh, structure where uh, there is an information exchange we don't know between whom my my main main uh, concern is to have this place as access to training and this training should be adapted to the local needs, to the regional needs. And we all know that needs for public administrations are not the needs for vocational education and training or are not the needs for reskilling and upskilling in some sectors of our industry. So uh, I, I count very much on you here really always to raise how important it is to transform the digital education hubs in a place where our citizens can acquire skills and competencies and can see for opportunities how with these trainings and formations that are offered to them, they can have better conditions of life and they can have better careers. Another important topic here, I want to see the digital education hubs as a point of meeting between providers of these services and citizens, because we don't talk enough about ed tech in Europe, but ed tech is one of the most growing sector for the last one and a half year. I now I started this work in July, I organized the first round table with the first companies that are very much engaged because we need to work closely with them. That's a business model, that's opportunities for jobs, that's opportunities for economic development of our regions. And in Romania, you have a very good example, so we count, we count on you. Mr. Markula, I don't agree since the beginning that missions are uh, following the approach on top down, not at all. Since the beginning, our main concern, it was to have a real co-creation process with our citizens. And that's why I talked about not only co-creation, but especially about co-implementation process. That's why for me, the bottom-up approach is the right one. Our missions are entering now into a crucial phase. 
Now we know what we would like to achieve, but you are right, we have to ensure the transition. And this transition can be adapted, can be sustainable, can be future oriented, if since the beginning we are working closely with regions. And that's why for me, when we talk about the mission on smart cities, climate neutral cities, what is important now is to scale all the good practices that already exist. You mentioned some of the cities and I can see perfectly well now how all the mayors, EPP mayors from these cities are united forces and they can in that case propose a new action in, in our missions. And I don't agree that missions are only about transfer from very high uh, uh, research results or knowledge results to, 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 the, to the ground. No, this time what we want exactly is to inverse this logic and, and to discover and to map and to see thanks to our regions, what are the practices that already exist. And because there will be united efforts, joint efforts, because there will be scaling up of the initiative, because these models are transferable and inspiring others, they can contribute to a European leadership and to a European uh, achievement of the, mission, of the ambitions of the mission. So I very much encourage you again to follow very closely because as I said, at the end of the year, by the end of the year, we'll publish the first goals. And I'm sure that already with the practices that you mentioned, I see here a perfect candidate to be a leaders, to be leaders in this, in this mission. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, I wonder, does Mr. Gerse like to come in there with a question? Mr. Gerser? Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, please be brief. My, my, my question actually is how, how Europe is uh, on a uh, European Commission level is uh, uh, thinking to uh, breach the digital gap uh, in the infrastructure. Because we have, uh, for example, in Slovenia, in Slovenia like 86 percentage of coverage of white spots but the, um, the coverage of the last 10% or 15%, 16%, 14%, 14%, it will be very quite uh, hard and uh, probably governments would need some more money, in, especially in rural areas uh, where, the, 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 where, where, where the landscape is hilly in order to cover this. Um, so that's basically my, my question on the, on the infrastructure level. Thank you. So finally, Commissioner Maria Gabriel to reply. Our member states have this money at this moment at their disposal, it thanks to the resilience and recovery facility plans. Because when you look at, at the different plans that are submitted and that we received, I must say that it's very encouraging to see that our member states have taken some lessons from the pandemic. And when we talk about connectivity and equipment, they decided to make a great effort. But that's why I'm always saying, the question is not just to have equipment and connectivity. The question is to have the people with the right skills to use them. If teachers, if they are not well equipped, if there is no access for for, for, for the different levels of competencies and people that they have them, that will not serve for something. And that's why here I have a, another concrete examples. It's my initiative that I already proposed with the Digital Education Action Plan and very soon that will start is connectivity for schools. We all know that in rural, in remote areas, the connectivity, it's not at the level that we would like to, to see. And that's why using our experience Wi-Fi for EU, and I must say that that was a good success story. We need to promote now connectivity for schools, schools in rural and remote areas where we can provide them a voucher in order to have free access with good speed of internet. Immediately after, again, for me, it's good to talk to our children and to our teachers about artificial intelligence, virtual reality. But if, again, they don't have the right competency, skills, the possibility to have trainings and to reskill, to upskill, to discover this, this world, that will be very difficult for them. That's why, in parallel, we have to pay attention to blended learning. We have to pay attention to vulnerable groups. And we have to pay attention how, together with our member states, 
This time, this critical enormous mass of investment will be used for reforms, for inclusiveness and for sustainability. Thank you, Commissioner. And um, finally, can we thank you for your attendance here today? And we appreciate that you have a very busy schedule. So we bid you farewell. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always my pleasure. And again, congratulations to the EPP Group in Committee of the Regions. Important topics, concrete solutions, and joint efforts. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now moving on, um, it's my great pleasure to uh, show you two contributions sent in by members of the EPP Group in the European Committee of the Regions, who will share with us their views on the subject. So uh, let me start with the message of Mr. Emil Bock, Mayor of Cluj in Napoca and former Prime Minister of Romania. The city of Cluj Napoca hosts the largest and most renowned university in Romania. In his role as Mayor of the city, Mr. Bock is designing and implementing very inspiring policies aimed at using his own words, at making the city an extension of the campus with opportunities for learning and making a difference. So we will now launch the video. According to André Malraux, the future of cities and regions will be digital or it will not be. We cannot slow or stop the entrance of the digital tools into our day-to-day -day lives nor should we want to, for that matter. Beyond the hard challenges that this reality arises for the public administration, the context is one that will ensure a better access for all to public services and also will make our cities and villages more inclusive. Therefore, me as a mayor, I strongly welcome this new normal, the digital future of us all. What is important for us the leaders of communities today, is to ensure that digital transformation is done in the most direct, ethic and safe way that can positively be done. And also to work with uh, soft measures into making this journey together with the citizens that need to be part of the co-design of our common future. The infrastructure, both hard and soft, that the digital transformation process implies can be one of the main economical boosters that Europe can find in these challenged times as we are passing together. COVID-19 disruption not only showed the urgent need to adapt to new ways of working and living, but also accelerated acceptance and common engagement in the process of digital transformation. Making this historic journey from one era to the other can be the most resilient and participative way human beings pass in the new fourth industrial revolution and here in Europe we are the ones best equipped for such a, an outcome. So together we can take Europe, Europeans, cities, regions, villages to a place where we all share services, products and lifestyles in symbiosis with the digital environment in a safe space that ensures free and equal access to all the best quality of life possible. All this while fueling the new European economy generated by the digital transformation process, supported by the European Commission mission and values. Green, digital and resilient. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. That was wonderful. And now we have another video, uh, a second contribution, which comes from Mrs. Romy Carrier, who is a teacher, a city councillor in Clairvaux in Luxembourg, and also the Committee of the Regions Rapporteur for the European Commission, Commission proposal on youth employment support. Let's listen to her message together. Dear President Gevlovich, dear Chair, colleagues and guests, I am particularly pleased that the debate today is devoted to the role of digitalization to support recovery and resilience. 
This is the topic that touches upon all layers of the society, no one excluded. As a co-reporter co on the youth employment support, the so-called youth guarantee, I wish to share with you some thoughts that I hope will contribute to your discussion and precisely on the role of digitalization in support to the employment of young people. I would like to express my gratitude to President Gevlovich for asking my point of view and I'm happy to see that there are so many interested and committed guests following the EPP core event online and physically as well. To start, I believe we all should ask ourselves what young people want and what they expect us to deliver. As it was recently stressed by the European Youth Forum at the time of the publication of the Youth Guarantee in 2020, young people want to pursue their personal ambitions, access quality education and training, find a decent job which provides long-term security, fair pay and learning opportunities. Answering to the second question, they want us to deliver credible policies, translate it into concrete and tangible initiatives, transparent information and simple but effective communication. As part of a broader strategy under the European Social Fund Plus, the Youth Guarantee, with its still uncertain financial resources and its limited scope in ancient time, cannot meet all the expectations alone but gives a strong signal of the attention of the European Union for the needs of young generations. Ensuring young people have adequate digital skills is a top priority for the European strategy aiming at reducing disparities and non-employment among young people of up to 29 years old. We guess, together with other societal changes, um, the digitalization and technological change are new on the top of the list of the priorities facing job market. Young people need effective support to handle changes in the labor market and need to be upskilled and reskilled to face transitions. The consumption of ICT and digital media among young people has created the myth of the digital natives. Beyond it, the idea that young people who grow up surrounded by digital technologies intuitively know how to use them and how to avoid the risk of spending time online. However, when it comes to the use of the technology and on the internet, there is a clear preference given to communication and entertainment activities, including participation in the social networks, while engagement in more advanced tasks is rather limited. For example, only 13 of the young people have engaged in programming activities. 11% have taken part in online consultations or voting the define and define political civic issues and just 10% have engaged in online training and many subjects. Basic digital skills represent a must for participation in rapidly changing society and the labour market. Actions undertaken by the European Commission, such as the recent proposed Digital Education Action Plan, the reinforced skill agenda and again the reinforced guarantee will have an impact that all remains to be analyzed after the full deployment of, of the provision included in the multi-annual financial framework and in the meantime what regional and local authorities can do to support digital skilling and reskilling of the young people. Several so stakeholders in the EU tell us that there are, uh, is a, store, a shortage of skilled workers in many European countries is predicted for the future and already exists today. The time to trace skilled workers for tomorrow, of tomorrow is now already now, today. The Youth Guarantee Scheme can and should contribute to this also with the vision of regional and re re local administrators. They participate in the policy making, participating in the outreach and mapping phase of the reinforced youth guarantee. Therefore, they need appropriate financial resources from both national and EU budgets to reinvest it in achieving real professional integration, especially of vulnerable young people. They boost information, making sure that sufficient budget is allocated by the central government in the frame of the European Social Fund and inform their citizens accordingly. They create synergies 
when driven by sufficient motivation and management spirit, they can help establishing private and public partnerships, aiming um, at organizing traineeship and apprenticeship to provide digital learning for young people, which can help them to decide on their future career and develop their digital skills in order to access permanent employment especially micro as well as small and medium-sized enterprises do not have alone the means to do it without the support of a dynamic local authority. Dear guests, these are only a few ideas for me, my side, and I hope uh, can provide some food to th your thoughts in your, our debate today. I conclude by wishing you all the best of the outcome of this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carrier, uh, for that inspiring discussion. And uh, now we'll go straight to our second panel because we are cut for time. And I would like to introduce and start with our friend and colleague, Marku Makula. This session is on tackling the digital divide for Europe's recovery, local and regional authorities for a competitive and resilient Europe. Marku is chair of ISPO, City Board and President of Helsinki Region. Marku, as an expert in the field and an engineer yourself, what are the main challenges and obstacles you identify for regions and cities to close the digital gap? Which recommendations would you give to a regional and local administrator to overcome such, such obstacles? And do you believe that investing on a high quality digital education ecosystem in the EU can help achieve the digital transition? And I'd ask you to please keep your speech to five minutes. Thank you, Marco. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind and challenging introduction and as well your questions. Let me first stress heavily that the key with digitalization is that it needs to be embedded in all the processes. It's not a separate issue. It's not the technology equipment making miracles, but it's really that we learn to use that for the benefit of, uh, uh, let's say everything, especially uh, in education so that all children or uh, grown up adults, lifelong learners use that in their own daily life. And that's why what Emil Bock stressed uh, uh, a bit earlier about these digital innovation hubs and their role in the city development, that is the crucial point. And uh, the my kind my kind of kind of personal commitment uh, for our EPP led cities within the CR is uh, for the next couple of years is that every city needs to renew its operating model to ensure its future as a sustainable citizen city and as a digital society based on open, innovative collaboration and competitive sustainable growth businesses. So we cannot think cities as a separate public sector organizations, but the growth companies, small companies, startups, they are all crucial for the future of cities. And that means that the uh, welfare future will be invented by and inside the cities and, and villages. That's why I was very pleased to hear Maria Gabriel to stress that this emissions, they are not uh, from the top down, but they are co-creating new innovations. Uh, they are kind of co-inventing the future. She had very uh, challenging a few words there that I don't repeat all, but that was the key message there. And uh, definitely it means that we, the EPP local leaders, want the future to be sustainable, we will operate on all uh, uh, the dimensions of sustainability, economic and ecological, social, and I stress heavily, cultural. Cultural, so it's, it's uh, all forms of learning, 
arts design, especially the key messages coming now from uh, the EU initiative, the new Bauhaus, the mental growth. And that's why the cultural dimensions mention of sustainability is uh, so crucial. And uh, this uh, development to sustainability can only be achieved by the help of societal innovations, which are strongly supported by technological innovations, digitalization and progress. And this is why we always, we need to use the uh, new artificial intelligence, robotics, all those that embed those to be supporting the services at, the, and, at our cities. And there, let me just stress that what does it mean in very concrete form? Because I've just led uh, last week the strategy negotiation of my city Espo with all the political groups, and we agreed on a few kind of spareheads for the next uh, four year program period. And we started the services that services are provided by the entire city community, not just the city organization. Companies, organizations, other communities, they form this ecosystem, which Commissioner Gabriel stressed. So this is where the digitalization is and can help a lot. And I'm happy in the future to share with our other EPP-led cities. Let's work together and make this progress within the missions and with the other EU initiatives, because they are now, Commission is providing so many new instruments to our hands, and it's up to us to build this operational model. And I'm happy to share how we do that in, in practice with my city for the future of Europe. So in a way, answering as well the future, the conference of the future. So how we get the citizens to feel that Europe is bringing so much added value. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marcuna. As always, a fountain of knowledge and experience. And thank you for offering to share that expertise with everyone else. We'll now go to a short video from um, uh, Mr. Uh, Sirson, uh, which will be five minutes, and we watch this together. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings to the European Week of Cities and Regions from the municipality of Dolní Studenky which is situated 250 kilometers from Prague in the northeast of the Czech Republic. We are a true rural region. I came back after studies in Prague and Copenhagen, after internship in the European Union in Brussels, and I felt somehow natural to come back to my born region. Maybe it was because my mother was a mayor in that time and my grandfather used to be a mayor of our municipality before. It's already 11 years I work as a mayor in this municipality and I wished so that the example I made 11 years ago was a trend in the rural areas. It means so that young people come back to the rural areas. European Union is standing at the crossroad in this moment and we are facing a huge challenge of the future of the rural areas. I'm persuaded the digital transformation can bring back future to the rural areas. Tools like smart villages or community-led local development, which can engage people to plan their own future, can bring back the quality of life to the rural areas. Thanks to the technologies, you can work from home, you can study from home, your doctor can visit you through technologies to your home, you can communicate with the state from your living room. One of my friends, he lives here in a timber house four kilometers from here and he's designing high-speed railways from his timber house. On the other hand, I hope that even in the digital era, young people will still party in this nice countryside instead of meeting each other on the internet, that uh, we still will have possibility to go for a beer to a pub to discuss issues with our friends, that the local churches will stay a heart of the communal life. One of the crucial projects we are now doing in my municipality is building up broadband infrastructure. We have been planning it for three years. One year ago, 
the average connectivity of our citizens was from 4 to 8 megabytes per second. It was too slow to work from home. It was too slow to study from home. Even for me, it was much easier to sit in a car and bring application for a grant to the post office, four kilometers in Schumperg, than to upload it by electronic means. Today, every citizen of our municipality can, thanks to the combination of three different technologies, enjoy connectivity of 150 to 1000 megabytes per second. I already feel effect. There is a lot of young people from the region who would like to move to our municipality and live here. But smart villages are not just about technologies. They are first of all about people and their smart ideas. Also, social innovations are very important for the future of rural areas. Behind me you can see a castle from 16th century, which we change using 2 million euros from three different European funds into a unique integrated project combining social flats where mentally handicapped people are living with social cafe where they are working they just move three floors by a lift there is also a big family center uh, which is uh, attracting a lot of people and young people from the region there is also a space for community school for NGOs for seniors there are flats where young people, seniors or the minorities are living. Another pilot project we are now preparing on the level of Olomouc region is focused on telemedicine, concretely on the pregnancy diabetes. Future mothers, thanks to that, will not have to travel 120 kilometers through mountains to the regional hospital, but they will stay at home and measure the level of diabetes themselves and just the data will travel to the regional hospital and will be investigated. Rural areas are not a museum. Rural areas are smart. Remember, Europe starts in rural areas. Thank you, Redin. Very inviting background and uh, views there, I must say. Now, I'm extremely pleased to give a warm welcome to our friend Eva Medel member of the EPP group in the European Parliament and president of the European Movement International, uh, serving on the Committee of Industry, Research and Energy, as well as the Special Committee of Artifi Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Age. Dear Eva, very welcome to you. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Some of our questions are, what are the most advanced sectors and which are the ones that still lag behind? and need to be further supported by EU policies. And the European Parliament will be discussing the draft proposal for a regulation on artificial intelligence. What is the key crucial point of contact between AI and digital transition? I would like to also ask your point of view on the real state of play of the digital divide in the EU. Are you of the opinion that member states, but also regions and cities are on the right path? to reach a swift and well-functioning digital transition. Over to you, Eva. Thank you very much, uh, Deidre. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. That's indeed um, many questions out there. I'll try to be as concise as possible. Uh, but first of all, um, thank you for having me to the Committee of the Regions and to the EPP group. It's always a pleasure to exchange views with you. I'm particularly happy uh, to hear um, also Marco Marcula, uh, with whom we have discussed the subject extensively over the past couple of years, uh, but also uh, the president and mayors from various regions um, and understand specificalities. When we talk about the digital divide, I always kind of have a little bit of an of a, of a, of a inner laugh in a way. Um, and you wonder why. Well, Perhaps the reason is because it was more than 10 years ago um, that the World Economic Forum came with this um, important report on how to bridge the digital divide. Well, here we are in 2021, uh, not being able 
to solve that problem uh, in its entirety. Um, and I'm very happy that we have good examples of projects, of attempts um, that we could ideally amplify and most importantly, uh, try to, um, you know, um, adapt to other regions and perhaps find the possibility of implement similar projects there as well. Um, I'm Bulgarian, as some of you know, and I can see the digital divide on a daily basis. I was born in Sofia, and I'm very happy to say that Sofia uh, today is becoming one of the best places um, in Europe to build a startup. We have a lot of talent, we have a fast speed internet, we have good higher education, wages are, are relatively low, people are motivated, creativity is endless. But at the same time, we have young people that are leaving the countryside, leaving rural areas, uh, where the remaining population is detached from many of the advantages of the modern world, including um, the digital access um, to diverse information, public services, uh, and human uh, connection. But I have to say that it is not either or, it's not a black and white story. So many places have very different strengths and weaknesses when it comes to digitalization, as we have just heard uh, and seen. So I think the first issue to recognize is really the importance of looking very closely. Um, and this is why local and regional government governance um, are so important. Um, I have to say that there is a, a way of dealing with the digital divide. Um, but as you might know, I'm also very interested um, in the revolution of skills. So this is why I also would like to make an emphasis today on that point. If we look at data, if we look at statistics, we're going to see that 40% of the companies report, report that they cannot find uh, suitable skilled candidates for jobs openings in Europe. Um, therefore, addressing the issue of reskilling and scaling up and upskilling is really necessary, I think, today. Um, it will be important to ask ourselves what kind of skills will be needed for the next decade, not only for the months to come, but what skills are needed for jobs that do not exist currently, but of which we are gonna be quite sure they will be uh, there in the next few years uh, to come. What again data and estimation show is that 65% of the children entering school will graduate and work in a job that does not exist today. So many of those jobs will be in the digital sphere um, and will be less and less bound to one place. So digital, if done right, has the potential of bridging the digital divide uh, between places of current opportunity um, and uh, misery. So what can the EU do um, to foster skills uh, while respecting this national prerogatives? I believe is one of the questions we want to address. Um, well, recently, uh, the President of the Commission has said that we need a European Council dedicated to uh, education, and I'm very happy she said that. I've been repeating that all over and over again for the past couple of years, even I believe in some meetings uh, that were set up by the Committee of the Regions and the EPP group. Um, but I think there's also a local element to skill um, that national and regional authorities can better take care because um, those education systems are so different. And I think uh, where the EU uh, can help is with helping national and regional governments to think through the most difficult aspects of this uh, decade long transition. Um, and that is what will the demand be? What are the fundamental trends around which we should redesign our education system and its governance? Um, how can we bring new skills into companies, public institutions and academia uh, to be part of that process? Um, and perhaps just finally, I think we need to remember um, 
that the education system is a very um, robust um, system. Changes take time. Uh, changes will affect the labor market in 10 to 15 years. So we need to make sure that the European Union is there to support national and regional governments to stay on that course. Um, and this is why I very much, you know, admire the work of um, mayors, of regional governance, of everyone that's involved in the regional institutions, because you kind of are faced with the demands at first hand. Um, and you have to deal with them sometimes very, very quickly. Um, and your expertise and your knowledge is absolutely key for us within the Brussels bubble, in the Brussels institutions, to be able to address those concerns um, in the most effective way possible. And this is why I'm always very happy to be joining your discussions, because I learn uh, a lot, and this enables me uh, to bring back those messages uh, into their respective committees in the European Parliament. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Eva. It was a pleasure to listen to you. And uh, certainly, uh, you are a woman on top of your brief. We can easily say that. Um, can I go straight now to a video uh, from Hannah Danowska, mayor of the city of Łódź in Poland, please. And uh, this city is becoming a vibrant center of research and a living laboratory for innovative urban green and digital solutions. Can we go to the video, please? Um, Szanowni Państwo, oh yes, oh oczywiście yes, rozwój begin. nowych technologii wpływa na sytuację miast i regionów. W moim wystąpieniu chciałabym się skupić na dwóch aspektach tego wpływu. Nowe technologie powodują intensywny rozwój e-administracji, także lokalnej. Nowa e-administracja to już nie tylko podejmowanie działań w celu ułatwienia komunikacji z mieszkańcami. To nowe podejście do danych lokalnych, które administracja gromadzi i przetwarza. Na podstawie tych danych staramy się tworzyć coraz lepsze usługi elektroniczne odciążające urzędników i obywateli. To stały rozwój i intensywna praca przynosząca już sukcesy. Jednocześnie mamy przed sobą szereg wyzwań technologicznych i prawnych. Przykładem jest zapewnienie przejrzystości systemów sztucznej inteligencji, ale też regulacje wynikające z dyrektyw o otwartości danych, ogólnego rozporządzenia o ochronie danych osobowych, a także przyszłych regulacji w zakresie sztucznej inteligencji, zarządzania danymi i cyberbezpieczeństwa. Miasto Łódź, które reprezentuje wspólnie z Unią Metropolii Polskich, zrzeszającą 12 największych miast w Polsce, angażuje się intensywnie w prace legislacyjne, aby regulacje te były przyjazne wdrożeniom nowych technologii w administracji. Żeby tworzyć coraz lepszą i zaawansowaną cyfrową administrację, musimy posiadać także odpowiednie kompetencje oraz kadrę. Trudności z tym związane w mojej ocenie powinny coraz bardziej przekonywać nas do podejmowania inicjatyw na rzecz współpracy i wymiany doświadczeń. Możliwość transferowania usług i komponentów cyfrowych powinna być dla nas kluczem do obniżenia kosztów i przyspieszenia wdrożeń tych technologii w naszych lokalnych wspólnotach. Drugim aspektem ery cyfrowej, na którym chciałabym zwrócić uwagę, to konieczność pogodzenia władztwa lokalnego i samorządowego, które gwarantuje nam przecież Europejska Karta Samorządu Lokalnego, z nowymi regulacjami dotyczącymi cyfryzacji. Doświadczenia ostatnich lat pokazują, jak jest to ważne i trudne zagadnienie. Wspomnę tylko o sporach sądowych dotyczących dostawców aplikacji używanych do wypożyczenia samochodów, tak zwanego car sharingu, małych pojazdów elektrycznych, zamawiania noclegów, czy też kwestia przewozów osób i pośrednictwa w tym zakresie. Wydane w tym zakresie orzeczenia oparte na aktualnych regulacjach mają istotny wpływ na nasze prawo do kształtowania na poziomie lokalnym 
polityki przestrzennej, mieszkaniowej, transportowej, ale też na dochody władz lokalnych. Aby podkreślić znaczenie tego zagadnienia, warto wskazać na przyszłe regulacje, które są lub będą wypracowane na szczeblu ponadnarodowym. Na przykład regulacje związane z działaniem platform cyfrowych, pojazdami autonomicznymi, dronami czy też sztuczną inteligencją. Coraz częściej regulacje te przyjmują postać rozporządzeń Unii Europejskiej, a nie dyrektyw, co w sposób istotny ogranicza możliwość wpływu samorządów na kształt tych regulacji na poziomie prawa krajowego. Konieczne jest więc większe nasze zaangażowanie na szczeblu Unii Europejskiej. Regiony muszą aktywnie brać udział w tworzeniu tych regulacji i dbać o uwzględnienie pozycji samorządów w tych aktach. Well, thank you. Uh, that was a lovely video from Hannah Donowski. And I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate her for the excellent work she's doing for her citizens and for further reviving their living spaces. Um, we are due to close shortly because the interpreters um, do have to go. And unfortunately, we don't have much time for questions and answers. Um, and the transmission will end automatically. Um, following on from this, I would like to thank all the guests and all the participants this morning and all the people who contributed to this online debate. Um, thanks to the interpreters and the backroom, Carl, Belinda, Relucha and Barbara for their help in this uh, event this morning. Please continue the debate online with hashtag EPP Local Dialogue. I wish you all a pleasant day and good work in your future work. Thank you.